thank you all for having me. I'm very excited to get to present this work. So just really briefly to give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, I have a very uh, interesting interdisciplinary trajectory. I double majored as an undergraduate in physics and sociology, a natural pairing. Um, from there, I went ahead and I got my PhD in sociology from the University of Washington. And I'm now with the Center for the Study of Complex Systems. Uh, at the University of Michigan. So um, my orientation uh, has been fundamentally driven essentially um, on exploring the micro to macro transitions in social phenomenon, but specifically how they play out in cultural arenas um, from a more uh, non-declarative aspects of culture. So that's what I'll be focusing on today. That said, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about uh, really I feel bumps against um, a huge amount of work in other disciplinary context, anthropology, philosophy, linguistics. So I'm very excited to hear your feedback today. Uh, this is just one take on this process, but I feel like it's got an opportunity to be very richly informed from this interdisciplinary um, crowd. So um, the fundamental dynamic that I'm going to be focusing on today is arguably one that's central to uh, a lot of sociology as well as a lot of humanistic fields, and that's that of social construction. Uh, I have learned never to assume that everybody has an understanding of what social construction is, nor a common understanding of what it is if they do have an understanding. So I'm going to spend a few moments talking about the type of social construction I'm going to be in interested in. So I think one of the most eloquent phrasings of social construction dynamics comes from the so-called Thomas theorem, which states, if men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. A uh, less eloquent way of putting this is uh, some people make stuff up, other people go along with it, and then over time it becomes facts. So <laughs> uh, that's a very general format. So that general broad structure that I just described arguably manifests itself throughout ubiquitously throughout social life. So uh, we can talk about for instance, the constitution of the state or any number of formal institutions following that pattern. Uh, norms, traditions, the part where we drive on the right side of the road. Today though, I'm gonna be specifically honing in on a particular aspect of social construction that has long been of interest uh, to uh, many people in a lot of different disciplines, specifically within sociology, within cultural sociology, uh, which has to do with the social construction of perception. That's basically how our social contexts uh, shape the very interpretations and meanings we automatically apply in our experience uh, individually and collectively. And to give some examples of this. Okay, so here I'm showing two superficially scenarios, but they come with very big differences in the interpretation and emotional reactivity uh, that they bring. So uh, ostensibly these are just two piles of burning cloth. However, on the left here, uh, we've got something that comes with a lot more symbolic import. Now notably, you don't have to consciously think about that. It's your share, our shared experience within a common cultural context that allows those additional layers of emotional reactivity, symbolic weight, etc., to come to mind. So that's one example of the type of social construction I'm talking about. A potentially more pointed example uh, can be seen in the following. So we can also talk about how um, different groups coming from different uh, social positions and cultural context within the same society are going to have very different automatic reactions and interpretations and emotions evoked uh, in encounters with either one of these two men. Notably, it is very uh, feasible that two people dependent upon their histories and social context will have two exactly opposite reactions to encountering. So if I come, if I'm a African-American individual who uh, comes from a cultural context which has had a lot of uh, bad relations with police officers, I'm likely to be more comfortable with interacting with the person on the right versus the left and vice versa, someone coming from a different. And again, these are interpretations, meanings, etc., automatic reactions that are being brought to bear on the situation without any conscious deliberation. Okay, so um, that's the type of social construction I'm going to be focusing on today. Social construction at this perceptual level, essentially the constitution of our shared uh, social realities. So the key thing to note here is that there was nothing essential about the meanings and interpretations that are being automatically imposed on those various scenarios I was talking about. There are no physical laws or natural facts that necessitate our response. That does not mean, however, that your individual way of making sense of them is any way idiosyncratic or even the product of your own conscious decision making. Um, in point of fact, how you react is shared among the group members of the cultural context of which you've been a part. Um, also, to note, 
we have some sense that in our own imposition, in our own of these ways of perceiving how it's going, there's something involved in our uh, usage of them that we know connects in some way to the continued reproducing and reinforcement of them in the shared social realities that we have. Okay? And that's the dynamic we're going to be worrying with today. And specifically, the main question that this, folk, this talk will focus on is whether or not we can model this formally. So um, how this question of how shared social realities arise, uh, how they're perpetuated or changed has been a focus of a lot of descriptively rich, usually uh, very verbose theoretical traditions that have had a lot of qualitative orientation. The goal here will be to develop a complementary perspective that gets added into a, a more formal uh, perspective. Right? Cool. So obviously, if I'm going to give a talk today, I believe the answer here is yes, but I'm not going to expect you to take my word for it. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to pursue this question um, in three stages. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to really dive into the cognitive mechanics of automatic sense making and experience via mental representation processes. And my purpose in doing this is to go in and find uh, the kind of crucial individual level aspects of the process that are going to allow us to get to these emergent dynamics. Now to get to those emergent dynamics, I'm going to show how in understanding the mechanisms responsible for individual mental representation, we can bring to bear um, a established body of work in complex systems or complexity research on the dynamics of such system. And then we're going to pursue the mapping of these two together to see what that can do to help us organize and clarify the dynamics of socially constructed perceptions and shared social realities. I'm then going to conclude uh, with a few implications for what this perspective uh, means for both the way we theorize and study culture. All right, to start. So um, I, I don't know if I necessarily need to belabor this point in this particular crowd, though when I present either to more rational choice crowds or natural scientists, I want to make sure to uh, point this out. So um, there's a well-studied and documented bias in psychology, which uh, referred to as na naive realism. And it basically refers to our tendency uh, in daily life to uh, mistake our automatic interpretations of what is happening for reality itself. And I believe it's a quote from the Bhagavad Gita, which states, we see reality not as it is, but as we are. And that's what we're referring to here. The reason I bring this up is not only because it applies to the object of what we're going to be uh, modeling today, but also because it has arguably been a bias that has tended to be reproduced in the way that we theorize social systems, specifically micro to macro theories, um, in that we tended to, we have a either explicit or implicit tendency to focus more on those purposeful or strategic or intentional aspects of human behavior, or even just those aspects of human behavior which are consciously accessible. That's not what we're doing today. What we're doing today is actually diving in and taking seriously um, kind of a huge host, decades worth of evidence at this point um, that has really forwarded the notion that a lot of what we do is not the product of any sort of rational, uh, calculative, consciously accessible uh, processing, but is instead arising on a very non-rational, consciously inaccessible way. Um, specifically, the work I'm going to be presenting today is going to um, be situated within a subfield of sociology research, which several of you are likely familiar with, which is focused on uh, culture and cognition, which is essentially how we can, in understanding the kind of contemporary research on unconscious processing in many of its different forms, what that can tell us potentially about its uh, social life and how it actually arises therefrom. Um, specifically, the most useful division or distinction that I have encountered to clarify what we're going to be working on today is one from UCLA's own Omar Lazardo, uh, which talks about the difference between declarative versus non-declarative culture. So culture is a big thing, as I'm sure you all are aware, um, and there are different aspects of it. So um, Lazardo defines declarative culture as being a uh, culture that is phenomenologically transparent and an elicited through linguistics report. Uh, sometimes this is described as the know that. So somebody tells you a fact about the United States that goes into your declarative memory system, you can go back and recall it. It only takes about one exposure, maybe two, a few more if you're not great at social studies. Um, so the key here to recognize is that this is the part, these are the parts of culture that are going to be accessed and deployed uh, through symbolically mediated formats. So language or some other right there. But they're basically accessible consciously. 
and uh, can be used deliberatively. The part of culture I'm going to be focusing on today, however, is non-declarative culture. So uh, Lizardo describes this as phenomenologically opaque and not open to linguistic articulation. So sometimes this is described as the know-hows of a cultured. Uh, so this type, this level of culture is acquired um, more slowly than declarative culture. It requires repeated exposures to experiential patterns. Those um, Experiential patterns lead to the formation, essentially, of automatic associations, not just within the head, but also with mo the motor system, um, which um, is that, which is why we call it the non-declarative, because it's stored in the non-declarative memory system. Now, the important part here is that though it can take a long time to acquire it, you have to be exposed to these patterns repeatedly. The deployment of it, once you have it in there, is very fast and automatic, and does not require any sort of conscious deliberation in order to employ. So that is the level of culture we're talking about the social, uh, with the social construction of perception. So specifically in the arena of non-declarative culture, I'm going to be spoking, uh, focusing on mental representation. So mental representation, much like culture, is a very big word that has been used in a lot of different ways. Um, so just to clarify, the way I'm going to be talking about it today is a very thin conceptualization of mental representation, and it's just going to broadly refer to the automatic and unconscious processes of association that is re responsible for the bulk of our immediate sense-making and experiences. So just to give you an example of what that looks like. Um, so this is a basic thin model. So um, we can start with the existence of a stimuli. So an individual, say me, encounters a sphere on the ground. It's got black and white polygons over it. When I look at that, when I uh, have the information come in about that stimuli from the environment, it activates uh, prior experiences. It goes into the memory system, pulls up prior experiences with things that looked kind of like that. From there, we then get a, what is called a spreading activation of other uh, experiences or concepts, even muscle memory that has historically been uh, co-occurred with um, stimuli of that type. So in the case of a soccer ball, the word soccer will come to mind, but also uh, I can potentially have a tension in my leg as a sort of an affordance of kicking, um, rules of soccer, associations with being from Seattle and them being really in Seattle, et cetera. So these are all things that would have historically co-occurred. It's from that spreading activation then that I'm able to lead, generate automatically on the fly without having to consciously try a host of inferences about what this thing is, what can be done with it, what others will be done with it, et cetera. So that activation of associations is what generates inferences that are automatically brought to mind. Once all that has been hap happening on an extremely fast, uh, at an extremely uh, fast time scale, only then do I have the conscious awareness of what that thing is and can make a set of uh, responses that are based on that structured aspect. So is that clear? Cool. Right. Uh, at any point, please stop and ask for clarifications. I prefer that. Um, OK, so just a f the final belaboring of this particular point, this is the arena we're modeling today. Uh, so we have stimulus. We have one of many representations. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, applied. That representation is going to then generate inferences and that lead to interpretations and expectations of what's going on. And then from there, only then does the conscious processing, which sits on top of those inferences, uh, take place. Okay? Um, so I mentioned here there are one of many possible representations. Uh, this gets us to the problem, we can the problem of what we consider polysemy. So with any given stimulus, there's a potential set of prior bodies of, associate, of established associations that I could apply to that stimulus to make sense of it in this automatic, fast way. And I think probably one of the best examples of this actually come from Clifford Geertz in his example of the wink. So the example given there is that I'm in a situation with another person and I see them close their eye and open it. How do I know what's going on? Is that a twitch? Is that actually an indication of conspiracy? Is it the burlesque of a conspiracy? Is it somebody making a point at a talk? Um, the point is there's a lot of ways to automatically interpret and make sense of what's happening. Uh, and the question is, how do we adjudicate what's going on? Which representation ends up getting applied? So that is going to be the fundamental driver of our dynamics today. So the basic 
thing to recognize is that when it comes to these selection of which mental representation is going to be applied to structure my experience, it's fundamentally depended on inference validation, which is to say I apply a, refer a representation internally. Again, this, none of this is conscious. Uh, a representation is implied. It generates inferences. It then, those inferences can then either by uh, taking in additional information from the environment be confirmed or disconfirmed. They can be validated. So my interpretation, my expectation holds, at which point um, I have a confirmation of my representation. That feeds back into the system and that means that going forward, that representation will be more accessible and can very quickly come to dominate in the way that I structure my understanding of what's happening. Conversely, if the inference is not validated, this is a disconfirmation of the mental representation. It becomes less accessible, and if I have a competing representation that is doing a better job of explaining what's happening, that will take over. So in the example of the wink, I'll have to be taking in essentially context clues uh, to, in order to understand. I will have an assumption that this is a burlesque, but I'll need confirmation from the continued interaction to signal that that is correct or not. Cool? All right. So that's our basic engine that we'll be dealing with today. So the question of this confirmation process um, in non-social context is, relatively speaking, pretty straightforward. So in a non-social, let's say physical arena, um, uh, it, the feedbacks are going to be a lot less complicated. So to give an example, uh, we can think about maybe you're walking through kind of a forested area. Uh, you're thinking about something else, like which slides you're going to put into today's talk or not. Um, so, and you have automatically running in the background a uh, representation of the ground in front of you as being solid. Now, it could be that there is some marshy bits to this forest that you may or may not be aware of. So, this, on this ongoing online representation is going to be telling you that the ground in front of you is solid. You put your foot down. And the inference that you're making is that this will support your weight. Now, at that moment in time, the ground either will support my weight or it won't, and then my foot will get wet, and then I'm going to have a massive invalidation of that uh, representation, and I'll have to rapidly update it to be a liquid. Okay? So schematically rendering that, we can think about it as follows. So here at the top, I've just got the kind of macro structural level of information about the physical environment. That relatively, for those, these purposes, static set of information uh, is used to cue the particular representation that I'm going to use. So it looks like it's a solid, so et cetera. That cueing of representation at the individual level, which is down here, is then going to lead to those automatically generated interpretations and expectations. Then based on those interpretations and expectations, I'm going to engage in whatever behavior, such as putting my foot down. So maybe this is going to but can you clarify how this meshes with the declarative, non-declarative thing? Right. So this is all happening non-declaratively. So we are in the non-declarative arena now. <coughs> Later, at the end of the top, like the end of the second section, we'll get back into uh, consciously accessible. But for right now, we're in non-declarative world. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. So are you in this model? So the information about the physical environment. Are you sort of modeling that as it exists, and we're sampling it at a yeah sort of yeah. So it is a. Couldn't it also be that we're, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. buyers are going to bias how we're sampling? Yes, we're yeah, so that's a much more nuanced version, so I will get into some deeper formalisms later, uh, which that totally applies, right, because I can only preferentially. But for right now, we're going to treat it, the, the fundamental thing to recognize here is that the set of information that exists in the physical environment is going to remain independent upon how I represent it. Does that make sense? My way of behaving with it will be driven, but um, the physical environment, so me conceiving of the ground as being solid will not make it solid uh, just by me applying that representation. Uh, it will have no ability to affect that unless we're in Harry Potter kind of style stuff, in which case <laughs> we could talk about that. Uh, okay, so the key point here is that there's an independence um, of the environment from our representation of it. Now let's talk about a uh, ideal, uh, kind of idealized social scenario. All right, so when we enter, so we can think about this example of entering into a situation with a bunch of other strangers who also don't know anyone uh, who we're about to interact with and don't know what's going on. So this is a bit of a toy model, but it illustrates the core dynamic, okay? So we go into this situation and everyone is unsure initially on the um, degree of formality that is expected or appropriate to the interaction. So what's going to happen here is that 
this selection between formal versus informal representation, which inferences are going to be valid for me as an individual, is going to fundamentally depend upon the representation that others are applying to the situation. So if everybody thinks it's formal and I think it's informal, I'll go in, I'll interact, and I'll have some fast uh, disconfirmation of the informal, as assuming that I can participate socially, which is a uh, thing to take on side. So, uh, but in this scenario, let's talk about what happens when a bunch of individuals, everyone is uncertain, okay? So when this happens, um, we go in, nobody knows what's going on, there's not a clear definition of the situation yet. I then interact and potentially just accidentally, um, I use a overly formal word, something in my tone or my presentation, signals to make it seem as if this might be a formal interaction. What that will do is put information into the social environment that other individuals will pick up that confirms their formal representation and disconfirms the uh, informal representation. Now, if that happens and their representation of formality gets queued up, their subsequent behavior, if it's in conformance with that representation, will then uh, cause them to act in a more formal manner, which will add more information to the social environment about formality, which will then confirm my representation, and back and forth, so on and so forth, until we're basically in a formality equilibrium that uh, is now stuck. Now, that could have gone a different way. If I had said one different word, et cetera, we could have ended up in an informal equilibrium for what's going on, but right there. So to kind of illustrate that here, so I'm not expecting that there to be many rational choice or analytical sociologists in the crowd, but if there were, you might recognize here a Coleman boat, okay? So again, we have the aggregate level at the top, individual level at the bottom. In this case, what is happening is there's an initial body of social information that is used to cue uh, a particular representation at the individual level. This leads the individual to impose a representation uh, that leads to a set of interpretations, expectations that they then base their subsequent behavior upon, okay? That behavior then aggregates across all those individuals to constitute a new set of information in the social environment. And the key thing I wanna focus on here is that dynamic nature of the social environment. Whereas before my representation of the ground as a solid or liquid did not change the nat essential nature of it, in a social interaction, it very well could, okay? Um, so that new set of social information, if I, this was drawn technically correctly through time, it would be used to confirm or disconfirm the next step, but you know, this is better. Uh, so, um, <coughs> Right, and the key thing to point is that the individual might be perceiving the social information as an aggregate kind of structural aspect of the situation, but it's being produced continuously through this uh, individual layer process all the time. All right, are we clear on that? Cool. So the reason that uh, we went through that journey is because um, I'm making the argument here that when it comes to confirmation of mental representation in social situations, it is a strongly interdependent process that is fundamentally driven um, in the immediate time scale towards syncing or coordinating our automatic interpretations of the world with one another. Um, so the, the key point to recognize here is that the fitness of a mental representation is not really driven uh, necessarily by its long-term uh, survival advantage or uh, some sort of adaptive fitness. It is driven in the immediacy by the ability to create a valid inference. And in social situation, the validity of my individual inferences uh, is going to be fundamentally dependent on the inferences that other individuals are making, okay? So the reason that this becomes significant is that what I've just described here verbally um, connects mental representation in social context to a wider class of models that have been explored in complexity research on social learning and social influence processes. It basically means that we can now bring to bear the known dynamics of that class of models to this question of the constitution of shared social realities and the social construction of perception, Okay, which is what we'll do now. So as mentioned, um, the emergent dynamics of social learning and social influence processes is something that has been pretty extensively studied within the arena of um, 
uh, kind of computational social science, the older version, which was focused on modeling, as well as complex systems research, um, we're using a primary tool of agent-based modeling, which I'll describe in a minute. Okay. Um, also to note, the um, connections with prior models extend not just to models of social systems, but also models that have been developed within statistical physics as well. So again, these are well-explored types of systems. So um, in point of fact, many of these models have been applied to uh, models of culture as well. But the task that's going to be here in front of us now is to specifically map those known emergent dynamics to the more universal class of models, uh, this more universal class of models in the context specifically of mental representation in social environments, that is non-declarative culture or in the context of shared social realities. Right. So um, I have a separate slide on why we should do this. I took it out for your benefit, but I'm happy to, happy to make that argument later in the Q&A if you want. Okay, so to do this, I'm gonna use actually an extremely simple agent-based model just to illustrate social learning dynamics and start considering how they might map to the social construction of perception or shared social realities. Um, so to do this, I use agent-based modeling, and for those I don't assume that people are necessarily familiar with this, so to just describe that really quickly. Um, Agent-based modeling is a form of computer simulation that's designed um, with a set of simple autonomous little programs we're gonna call agents that uh, essentially act according to some basic relatively simple rules. Uh, once they, you give them the rules, you can then specify further who's gonna interact with whom, uh, whether or not there's an environment, if they're going to interact with that. And then once set up, and this is the key part, once we set this up with the autonomous programs, I then let this go of the system. Without, uh, usually without any intervention, I just see what happens when these agents interact according to their simple rules and um, come back and analyze what has gone on. Um, the reason that this has been favored for a lot of complex systems research is this is a great way to get at emergent properties. So essentially how spontaneous order arises unintentionally from the interactions of individuals, okay? So in, in this case, we're going to be thinking about what this means for uh, the social construction of perception. So uh, these agents, again, very simple. They're gonna have, uh, each agent's gonna be imbued with the ability to play one of four possible representations that is going to be driven by their interactions with others. They're gonna attempt to match, essentially, uh, come to a common representation of those that they are interacting with. Um, they're all gonna begin in a random initialized state um, nobody really knows what's going on. It's like that example I gave earlier. Um, they just kind of have their best guess at what might be happening, but they're weak guesses. Um, and I'm also gonna set them on a static interactional structure. So this is a network. Each tie denotes an interactional partnership. Um, this is something that can be modified in other extensions, et cetera, but I just want baseline results right now. So I'm gonna give them who they're gonna interact with. They're gonna start in a random state, and then I'm gonna allow them interact. And so for each turn of interaction, they only have two simple rules. The first one is a learning rule. And what's going to happen is the agent's going to look at all of its interactional uh, partners, which is an average of three or four. Um, and then they're going to see what behavior based, uh, which representation based behavior they're playing. So if I have two partners that are playing blue, one partner that's playing red, I update the confirmation weight for the representation of blue by two one for, uh, uh, by one for red, and then don't update green and yellow, okay? Uh, that's a simple reinforcement learning process. I then am going to allow agents to act. So whatever of their uh, representations has had the most uh, feedback, the most confirmation from their social interactions previously, they will in that next turn uh, play that. So if blue has been most strongly confirmed, I will then play blue, all right? So the question is, set uh, these systems up, let them go, what happens? Okay, so here I've got three examples of different uh, independent systems. So each of these began in the randomized state of uh, the sort that I just showed, uh, but over time eventually ended up stabilizing in perpetuity into uh, these respectively ordered uh, configurations. So the important point here is that this happened without any sort of top-down programming. There was no intervention to say this is how the order will work. They instead from the bottom up grew um, a spontaneous order just by virtue of their interactions with other agents. So what this basically establishes a baseline result uh, 
that states that um, from, makes the argument that from the dynamics of uh, mental representational and social constructs alone, you will get the spontaneous emergence of shared social context. Um, <coughs> so, uh, right, and so uh, I will have at the bottom here uh, different aspects of kind of more classical cultural sociological theory that these uh, relate to. Uh, I won't belabor that right now for time, but if anybody wants to talk about this, I'm happy to. Cool. So that's a baseline uh, result. That's good. Um, but there's also another level here. So something to note is that just because all the agents in the system might be driven towards syncing their representations of what's going on, uh, with uh, the others with whom they're interacting. It doesn't immediately imply that there's going to be, it's going to be possible to achieve a global system-wide uh, convergence on a consensus of which representation uh, should have uh, obtained. So on the far left, that has happened. Everybody ended up green and stabilized. But you'll note in these um, other systems, what we said instead got was a stabilized uh, pattern of grouping. So essentially, uh, it's characterized by uh, what Axelrod has referred to as local conformity and global diversity. The uh, substantive implication of this is, is that even if we acknowledge um, this uh, process of mental representation in social environments as being a fundamental driver in, in non-declarative cultural processes, that doesn't mean that we automatically should assume uh, an outcome of global, universal, everybody has the shared social reality. What in point is going to happen is that due to a known dynamic uh, called mimetic divergence, um, the constraints of local information, the local context of interaction, as well as the um, temporal evolution of the system is going to actually lead us more often to expect differentiation rather than unity. Um, notably also is that that uh, at least in this very simple setting, that determination of differentiation versus full consensus is going to be very strongly uh, driven by the kind of macro level features of the network structure. So this is a uh, graph. So I, you know, like a good agent-based modeler, I ran many simulations and looked at the outcomes. Um, at the bottom here, um, I've got the network me metric of average path length of the network. So the shorter the average path length in a network, basically, the more readily information flows across it. And on the y-axis here, I've got the number of subgroups which eventually formed and stabilized. And you'll note this is basically pointing to, while we've thought about network structure a lot in terms of the transmission of, say, cultural practices or piece of information through a social system, this indicates that we should probably also be thinking about it when it comes to the construction of shared social realities as well. Okay. So in addition to seeing those end results of the systems, uh, and the shape of the orders that ultimately obtain. We can also use uh, the dynamics of social learning systems in this agent-based model to talk about the temporal changes and how these systems of shared representation are gonna change through time. So it's important to note first that while these systems have stabilized into their final configurations in perpetuity or until I shut down the program, uh, this doesn't mean that that same process of learning and behave that process of learning and behaving that they've been engaging in has stopped or has changed at any point in time. In point of fact, what we're going to see here is that those same processes of uh, behavior and learning, that confirmation, uh, imposition of a representation and confirmation that led to the emergence of shared social realities will be sufficient to also explain their reproduction and persistence. Um, so that is like what I was talking about earlier um, when we were kind of getting trapped in the formality equilibrium uh, example. Uh, so that arises through a process of lock-in, essentially. So uh, my inferences become valid, and that they're all valid. We all understand what's going on. We become locked into that pattern. Lock-in is also uh, a dynamic that relates directly to another feature of temporal development in these systems, which is that of path dependency. So path dependency here is going to refer specifically to the property of these position, uh, systems as being extremely sensitive early on to individual actions. Um, so that, for instance, uh, relates to me accidentally using a more formal form of address earlier. Um, over time, what's going to happen, though, is that sensitivity to initial uh, actions is going to give way to the emergence of group effects. So essentially, individual decisions on our decisions, individual interpretations of what's happening will matter a lot early on, 
But over time, those individual deviations will matter less to the macro level shape of the system. Um, I think this is cool because uh, there's a, you can poetically describe this as a sort of cognitive symmetry banking in social systems, wherein uh, in, like initially many systems could have ended up uh, going any number of directions, but um, over time what happens is that uh, particular, uh, particular forms get picked up, get locked in, and you have a very different uh, non-declarative cultural uh, order than you would have otherwise. Now the reason I think that this is uh, relevant, especially for actual cultural research, is that it points to the continued necessity of having the particular historical knowledge of the development of a cultural system. It basically points to the fact that these uh, developments, uh, these systems will be extremely contingent in nature and that uh, while we might be able to anticipate that shared uh, social, shared social representations will arise, we can't a priori predict what their content will be because they're going to be very subject to these early accidents. Okay, so, so far, I've been talking about these systems in terms of the expressed behavior. But, and this kind of gets into some of the stuff I'm most excited about working on next, um, is that using this modeling approach, we can also go to another level and start talking about what's happening underneath the hood. So uh, these are the same systems that I was showing as before, but now I'm using the shading of the agents to reflect uh, the match that is occurring between those individuals' uh, most uh, dominant representation for what is occurring socially and what that agent is actually experiencing interactionally. So here, the darker the color, the better the match between the representation that is being applied to social interaction and what they are getting confirmed back in their social interaction. So um, <laughs> you'll note specifically here in the two systems on the left that there's a distinct pattern of darker agents in the middle of the groups um, surrounded by agents who are lighter colored. So what that is indicating is that those agents, if a yellow agent is in the middle of a yellow group, there's a strong congruency between their representation of what's happening socially and their interactions with others because they're only interacting with other people, uh, other agents who are behaving according to the yellow representation. Now if you go to the edge of the group, however, we've got a different scenario. So this uh, individual at the edge of the yellow group up here is more lightly shaded. And the reason for that is that even though that individual has stabilized forever into applying the yellow uh, representation for what's going on, they continue to interact with others who are not part of the yellow group. Instead, they are interacting, in this case, with a blue member. So what that's going to mean is that even though that they have settled on that representation for what's happening, they're going to continue to get feedbacks from their social interactions, which are saying that that representation isn't quite uh, correct. So the reason that this pattern scene is interesting is that it's actually very reminiscent of um, a, a kind of better known uh, type of patterning from complex systems research, which is characterized by um, areas of frozen or entrenched individual components within a system that are surrounded by seas or areas of less well settled um, individuals in the system or individuals in the system who are experiencing tension. So this pattern is actually known to be reflective of the property of so-called evolvability in the system. And so to understand that, uh, what we could think about here is that those less strongly confirmed agents who are on the edges, due to the fact that their representation is not doing as a good job describing what's happening socially as those who are in the middle of the group, are going to be more prone to want to change if a better representation comes along that does a better job. So in this situation, we can think about a yellow agent who is hanging out next to a red group. Um, in these simulations, they're not a, given the ability to change or create new representations, but if they were, we would expect that those agents at the edge of the group would be most likely to either adopt or develop a new sort of orange representation, which does a better job of describing. Now, how this dynamic works is that from that in initial individual flipping, that can then subsequently influence the other less settled agents around them. Sometimes that's not always, but sometimes that d dynamic can subsequently lead to a cascading through the entire system of change that will arise. So that is a concept of self-organized criticality um, in complex systems talk and the systems which have that patterning express that. Now to contrast that, 
We could talk about the system on the far right here, um, which is experiencing essentially a runaway confirmation process. Um, this is basically a situation where everybody is only interacting with other individuals who are also playing the same representation as them. So what's basically happening is they're becoming completely entrenched in this representation of uh, the social world because they're never having to interact with individuals playing a different representation. So you know, nominally we might think about this achievement of system-wide consensus as being uh, good for facilitating coordination or ease of social life. But in this broader context that we're addressing, it actually points to these systems being more brittle. Um, essentially, th because they are so entrenched, they have a harder time updating. And I'm happy to talk about some old school stuff uh, Durkheim did on social density and deviance. To, uh, I think there's a cool mapping there. Now, here's the coolest part to me, not to load it right there. There's actually, because of the cognitive grounding of this model, we can actually go another step further to think about what is happening back at the individual level vis-a-vis -vis this uh, system level dynamic. Okay, so from a variety of literatures, both in cognitive science and behavioral economics, um, we have a strong reason to believe that inference and validation on the automatic level um, is responsible, can be responsible for driving elements from the situational background out of automatic processing and to becoming available uh, for more deliberative conscious uh, addressing. So um, <laughs> a lot of this comes from uh, conflict monitoring and cognitive control literature. Um, which basically talks about, um, I'm going to use the term kickover, that when there are major failures in your automatic processing of what's happening, um, it makes those elements a lot more likely to be pushed over into your conscious awareness to be dealt with. And so one of my favorite examples of this comes from an AI and neuroscience researcher, Hawkins, who talks about an experience uh, with your front door. So presume that you live somebody where for a long time and you're thinking your big academic thoughts, not really paying attention as you walk up to your front door. So as you're going, you take your key and you go to put it into the lock, but sometime during the day, for whatever reason, somebody has come by and taken that lock and moved it three inches over. Okay, so what's gonna happen at that point in time? You're going to suddenly be jolted out of your intellectual reverie and your attention is going to be brought to what's happening in front of you. So what's basically happened is that there's been a lot of automatic expectations that were running in the background. There's been a dramatic failure of them. And without you having to consciously expend effort, your attention has been brought to what's going on. Okay? So given that understanding, let's now go back to this model and talk about how we can combine that system, those insights into system involvability to this cognitive, this aspect of cognitive functioning. So the basic mapping um, that we can kind of think about here is that when individuals are experiencing higher levels of confirmation, when their representations of what's happening socially are more unproblematic, this is going to lead to an expectation that in general, they will experience greater automaticity in social life. They will literally not have to think about social life as much as other agents or individuals when they're experiencing lower confirmation. So this is just going to basically represent that if you're interacting, if your mental representation of what's happening socially is not doing as well at describing what's happening, you're going to become more likely to have aspects of that shared social background pushed into your conscious awareness. What this entails now is um, a statement about how these system level dynamics might manifest in individuals' experience of these aspects of culture. So specifically, it's going to uh, point toward an assertion that the stability of the system at the larger level um, is linked to higher confirmation and thus higher automaticity at the individual level. Um, so that's basically to say that system stability manifests vis-a-vis -vis greater taken for grantedness in social life. Uh, conversely, the system's potential for change at this level, so the non-declarative uh, cultural system's potential uh, for change is going to be linked to times and areas where individuals are experiencing lower confirmation, which is to say that those individuals experiencing lower confirmation are more likely to become consciously aware of their shared representations content strictly by this kind of cognitive kickover effect. So again, we can think about this temporally through time. So 
early on in an unsettled time where there's not an established representation, we're likely to have a lot more conscious energy expo like expended on what's happening socially. Once it settles down, that conscious energy will move off to something else. But we can also think about this in terms of where people are social, uh, situated in a social space. So if an uh, individual has to spend a lot of time going between two different or more social groups with different shared social backgrounds, the likelihood that they're going to be able to bring aspects of that background up to conscious processing will be higher because they'll have to. And I think a lot about uh, Du Bois's notion of one forever feels his two-ness in this respect. Okay, all right, so that's the model. <laughs> um, I'm gonna briefly wrap up with a couple of potential implications for viewing non-declarative culture in this way, uh, both for theory and research, give you a quick example of some applications I'm now pursuing um, within the context of economic valuation, and then open it up for questions. All right, so I think that in terms of face validity, um, there's a lot of encouragement to be had uh, between the connection between this body and a resonance with a large body of qualitative uh, more qualitatively driven cultural theory that's been developed previously. Um, I also, uh, this model I've given you today is very simple and it's extremely flexible, which means that it's very amenable to further systematic elaboration and development via modeling. And I'll give you some examples of how that might go. And I think it's also going to further motivate new avenues for empirically investigating and verifying the social construction of reality, both in the lab and in the field. Okay, so to examples in terms of theoretical implications. So one of the benefits of developing a thin, lightweight framework like this is that um, if, you, if you succeed in getting some initial traction, you can then uh, open up into a world of potential elaborations and changes. So for instance, um, there's ways of developing modeling extensions here. Um, I mentioned network structure earlier. We can also think about migration. I think that's a very easy and potentially very fruitful way now that this mapping is developed to think about the changes in shared social realities through these different demographic processes. Um, we can also now reintroduce the role of the non-social or physical realm. Um, and I'm not gonna go through these results, but this is an example of how this is done, wherein individuals in the system are both receiving feedbacks for their representation from the social environment and from the non social environment and how that lead, can lead to decouplings, for instance, of representations from uh, the physical reality. Um, that's one direction. Another direction, however, is to explore deeper formalism. So this really thin model of reinforcement learning um, is pretty far away from how we might actually model what's going on in individuals' heads. But there are other things, and I'll talk about Bayesian learning in a second, that do get closer. So it could be that we um, could uh, not only verify the dynamics I've talked about here, but also explore deeper other levels of what might be going on through greater, um, through investing in deeper formalisms. Also though, there's a question of how do we empirically verify um, a model of culture that's based on unconscious processes. So specifically, how do we verify uh, kind of some of the predictions from this that might arise from this perspective? So this again, um, I think, uh, intersects with a lot of work that's already being developed right now in cognition and culture research. So for instance, um, when it comes to testing for the presence of uh, these associations, we already have uh, tools for doing that. So that's, you probably are familiar with this, with imp implicit, sorry guys, <laughs> implicit association testing um, as a methodology um, uh, to, and this provides a way to model to validate the model, not just in the field, but also in a laboratory context, potentially. So we might actually have a pathway for looking at the social construction of reality in a laboratory setting. Um, I also, um, this is something I would like to pursue in the future, um, thinking more about this conflict monitoring and cognitive control response we're talking about. That has some strong um, markers, everything from pupil dilation to activation of the anterior cingulate cortex. And I think this would be, this uh, perspective motivates further exploration of this as a signal for when, for instance, a social breach or rupture has occurred for an individual. Um, and then uh, more concretely, um, I'll briefly mention a couple of things that I'm currently doing now with the social construction of economic value. So if we wanna talk about um, situations that are defined as real and become real in their consequences, arguably few can really match what we assign economic worth to. Um, and so towards that end, I've been uh, approaching how we can use these insights from this established model to our understanding of how we 
uh, on a non-declarative level, construct our notions of what has economic worth or not. So um, one example that um, I have forthcoming right now is uh, kind of pursues that deeper formalism I was talking about earlier, uh, using Bayesian updating uh, agents who, um, in a model that's related to what I've shown here, um, you can show how even in the absence of any sort of intrinsic worth to a good, uh, you can still get the emergence of stable economic valuations, which do over time give it real social value. And so we can think about that in terms of you know, the social construction of value vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Louis Vuitton bag, art, um, also though how I apply it, uh, money, why money has value, and kind of pursue uh, a kind of uh, question, like make the argument that it doesn't have to be um, a non-socially originating source of value in order to have real economic value. And the interesting thing here is that once you establish this model, you can then see how it interacts with things that might also have value in a non-social level, explore the dynamics of bubbles and conventions, et cetera. So uh, that's something different though. Um, more recently though, what I'm currently doing is looking at what this, um, so that former model remains relatively agnostic, agnostic to the type of learning going on. In this experimental work, we're really diving into specifically uh, non-declarative learning at the level that I've been talking about today. So uh, me and I, sorry, and a couple of other folks at the University of Michigan through a grant through the uh, University of Michigan are currently looking at how we can use uh, implicit association testing as well as um, established research in both psychology and marketing on evaluative conditioning, which is how individuals form automatic evaluations of things as liking or not liking, and how those might help to explain the um, cultural variations that arise between social preferences. So these are preferences and economic behavior for doing so-called altruistic type things. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, that is ongoing. We've had some initial positive results, um, but our long-term goal here is to see if we can establish a non-declarative mechanism that accounts both for that cross-cultural variation, uh, but also potentially crowding in and crowding out effects of social institutional designs on um, economic valuation. Cool. Conclusion, here's a summary. I'm not gonna repeat it all. Thank you all for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's not necessarily the end point for all your models. Yeah, right? that's correct. Sometimes you have some red, some green, some yellow. Yeah, so you have that uh, differentiation pattern. Exactly. So um, I was wondering when do you stop running your model? So I was yeah. imagining that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. That's a great. That's a, that's a fantastic question. You should be modeling if you're not. So what I do is I actually have a, I don't know if I have the slide for it, but I define a really strict convergence criteria. So I take. Uh, I construct a measure which is basically um, looking at the relative weights that all the individuals have for their respective models. And then I require that to, s that I take the average of that in the system and I require that to stay stable for a thousand terms. So basically that's indicating to me that you know, the relative weights have stabilized to what they're going to be and this is where right there. But that's a great, that's, uh, that's very important, thank you. So where, where do new representations come from? Yeah, so I can't get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into this type of modeling yeah, so I think one of the coolest part here, um, and the thing that we, especially in co like cognition culture stuff, is really thinking about the difference between uh, validation and construction of representations, right? So we experience new, new representations arise by experiencing regularities in the world. We also have limited computational power, so we can't encode every single regularity that we uh, arrive upon. So um, I would expect, I, you know, I personally think that a lot of this might have to do, there's a, there's a compression that happens in our heads, so we all go out. So you and I probably experience regularities that we don't encode as a shared representation. We could, but we don't, right? So the actual act of how those come to be constituted, um, I think um, 
is both an organic process, but also one that could potentially be uh, driven by more declarative processes, for instance. So kind of pointing out, you know, if somebody gives you a word for your experience, then you go to that word, then that um, recruits. Does that make sense? So, but yeah, I think that's, um, you know, fundamentally it occurs from experiencing regularities in your environment that are then uh, formed into automatic associations. I was wondering if there are any cases where disconfirmation would lead to, um, to entrenchment, at least over possibly, mm. you know, sort of a different temporal time scale. Because I'm wondering, you know, we, we talk sometimes about the people feeling, you know, the threat of yeah. your belief is under attack, or yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of like, I'm surrounded by people, yeah. so I'm going to like double down on what yeah, I believe. So that, so, is yeah, so that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see in the model or not, not in this model. This model's too simple. But I've thought about this in terms, so um, in like Bayesian networks, there's a kind of explain away functionality. So there is the ability to basically build in something into the model which discounts information that's coming in, right? So I'm really, I've been really interested in this sort of um, kind of, uh, you know, the, the construction of a victim identity, for instance, to help people to kind of radicalize individuals. Part of that, I think, could be um, kind of, for instance, coming up with the term fake news, right? So that means that you kind of set yourself up to explain away disconfirmations. Does that make sense? But that is not something that can get um, with the simple of a model. But I think it is an important question, though, they, that we can kind of build. Um, I will say with this model, though, um, there's a lot of potential for information waiting within it. So I have not, I've not played around with that in this baseline result, but both in terms of interactional partners, we could potentially put a negative weight. Like if this person says it, I'm not going to, I'm going to reject, I'm going to take that away from the confirmation of a particular representation. Uh, we could also talk about the content of the representation being like a more and more emotionally loaded to adjust the weights, etc. So there's a lot to, there are a lot of dials to turn on that that I think might be relevant to that question. Yeah. yeah, along the same lines, um, the, I've been thinking about it using different words, but I can try and translate them in terms of the um, it, it seems like there's likely to be a subordinate representation, which is the um, identity representation. Yeah. Okay, so what is your reference group is a, another way of saying how much does yeah. your identity match the identity of the source individual? Uh huh. And yeah, yeah, yeah. There are three possibilities. One is that it matches. Um, mm -hmm. One is that it is antithetical, right. and the third is that um, it doesn't match, but it's not antithetical. Right, right, right. And, right. and the, the first leads to, you know, um, positive feedback, yep, exactly. flow, right? Yep. The second leads to, leads to schismogenesis, mm -hmm. right? And, and um, the third is more like what your yep. current models are right, you know, right. describing. I, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think that the, the specifically the role, and I think this kind of touches on what I was saying earlier, the role of their, it, it's a nesting structure for um, a lot of this processing, I think. So if I come preloaded to be able to write off what this other person, because I've already labeled them as enemy or something like that, then that kind of preemptively decides how this information. Now, that said, that might go back into confirming that superordinate uh, representational yeah. system, right? Yeah. So I think at that point in time, um, it becomes very interesting and potentially very messy in terms of where we are at the level of which representation is being confirmed or not. I will say that this might get at the um, kind of advice politically, for instance, to not fall into the other person's script, for instance, because when you fall into the script, you just confirm uh, what's going to happen, and they can just knock out the weight of your representation. Yeah, or like following up very briefly on that, I mean, you mentioned migration as one avenue. Yeah. I mean, Self-selection of interaction partners, which is what oh, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. for, it, right? Um, yeah. It leads to the positive feedback processes and the schismogenesis, right? So right, 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 right. When, so when information from that mismatched yeah, yeah. coordinate identity yeah, yeah, yeah. is introduced into yeah. the, you know, the silo that is the yeah positive feedback loop, then we all discount it. Yeah, yeah, and so I think this is again a question where that meta representational, that subordinate representation matters because they're, um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not sure about the, how solid the evidence for innate kind of seeking of novelty versus not is, but I could see very well that individuals who, for instance, have to spend a lot of time growing in between social groups might develop a taste for 
that experience, right? Whereas other individuals who self-select right there. But at that point in time, we can also think about how representations feed back in to that selection process. So there might be more homophilic representations versus more heterophilic representations. So at that point in time, you have a network dynamic where the two are informing each other. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, is there a formal difference um, in the way that you set up your model between the, these models and models of the spread of, of norms? Yeah, yeah, so not, so this is based on reinforcement learning versus contagion. So which is a little bit, which is a little bit, uh, there are some distinctions to be made. So um, I don't have a node, for instance, that is infected and then just spreads to other nodes with some sort of pop probability. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the reason that I went about this route, other than the part where I started from a different trajectory and came upon that later, um, <laughs> is specifically, though, I wanted to get to the arbitrariness of these social constructions. So I think that in the Boyd and Richardson model, and again, the, they're dealing with a larger time scale of cultural selection, um, uh, has uh, more concerns about the adaptiveness, uh, like the adaptive fitness of a model versus another. Whereas here, I really wanted to dive into this um, kind of uh, more, more classically social learning dynamic of um, like, for instance, this, of symmetry breaking, essentially. Because I wanted to be able to assert that this, on this time scale, the shared social realities, um, you know, and again, this is avoiding some of that old school kind of functionalist trap of assuming that there's any adaptive functionality to the way that we structure it. So I wanted to enfranchise essentially that insight from qualitative research and show how it also obtains formally as well. Adaptive rationality can be at the subordinate level, right? Mm -hmm. So if there is an evolved technology for you know, sensitivity to ethnic markers, yep. because yep. the nation occurs better sure. with individual yeah. forms, right? Then we are you know, predisposed mm -hmm. to, to, to identify at the level of sure. the subordinate markers. Yeah, so that's actually something that you can get at. So I mentioned those uh, non-physical, so uh, these sorts of systems, right? So we can think about biology not just the external environment, but our internal environment, um, constituting a source of feedback for this automatic interpretation of what's happening. Um, and then, so in some instances, we might, know, you know, kind of, there might be enough social influence to uh, swamp out uh, in some societies or some cultural contexts to swamp out what might be a biological predisposition toward that and others not. So in those situations, um, the, uh, I think that the biology, external environment, et cetera, act as, can act as anchors or ballast to what representations arise, but they don't fundamentally determine them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. that's what Dan calls attractors. Yeah, yeah, attractor, exactly, exactly. Um, but here, I'm, so the, the emphasis on social learning, I think, is important because in addition to given attractors, you have the formation of attractors. So you can describe these systems as accidental attractors form, but once they have formed, you're into it. So it's a co-evolutionary landscape, um, but it still behaves um, with some of the same dynamics. Hi, um, I have a two-part question. Yeah. Um, so I might have missed your explanation because I was late and I apologize. No problem. Oh, okay, great. So um, taken for granted is here. I'm kind of going back to sort of traditional treatments of it in a lot of cultural sociology, also in humanistic um, discipline, more humanities disciplines. But it essentially means that, um, in the way I'm referring to it is, I literally don't have to expend conscious effort thinking about it. So if I have a very taken for granted social, like uh, social interaction with a huge amount of uh, taken for grantedness, I literally don't have to consciously think about what's happening. We're all on the same page, we have a common definition of the situation, I can save what precious little conscious processing I have for other things that are happening within the situation. And then on that, on that note, so um, this might be in the paper, but what, when you uh, theorize about psychological mechanisms uh, that are responsible or involved in the establishment of autobiography? Right, so this is, that's a great question too. So this is a habituation 
essentially. So a lot of work that has been done in habituation or uh, the non-declarative learning systems is that what is what is going on is that the brain, because it has so little cognitive, like conscious processing, um, uh, is trying to essentially offload a lot of stuff continuously to automatic assist. So you can think about um, when you're developing um, a classic example of learning to play the piano, for instance, right? When you're first learning, it takes a lot of conscious effort, but over time, it gets encoded at levels below conscious processing. Um, and that's, you know, our brain has a, and so the, some of the work that's been done on habituation talks about how if you just expose somebody to uh, the constant set of uh, things that they have to do or constant set of associations, the brain will on its own just say like, okay, I don't have to, it's like getting bored, actually. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's the non-declarative memory system. Uh, yeah, right, which I kind of set up to talk with. Yeah. Cool. I have a, I have a yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, that in part of your, uh, the results that you got, you said that you, um, you realized that people involved in um, multiple social groups. Yep. I think this is one of the more interesting places to go right. with it, yeah. Um, which is something I can relate to. Yeah. So, 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 so the way I would phrase it is, and it's not a necessity. It just means that the probability that they're going to, um, what everybody else is going to be, able, so what other people in a social context might be able to take for granted, that they literally don't have to think about it or even really distinguish between what's their interpretation versus reality itself. Um, so you can think of somebody who's always been in the same small town forever in that kind of very parochial sort of way. Um, individuals who, for instance, are coming from the outside. And this, like, I think people experience this a lot with culture shock, right? When you go to somewhere that's very different, you have to think about not just what's going on socially in a way that those around you don't have to, you also end up thinking about your own prior context that you're coming from because stuff is failing. Your assumptions are not working and you're noticing suddenly consciously a bunch of stuff that you might not literally have ever thought about consciously before, right? So the expectation here is that individuals who, and this, uh, you know, for instance, relates to work in intersectionality, individuals who have to exist between a lot of different shared social realities are gonna spend more time with representations that they can't just pick up from whatever social group. They're gonna have to const more dynamically navigate them essentially, which doesn't mean necessarily they will become consciously aware of it. It just means that the probability that those are going to be pushed into conscious processing to navigate right there. Uh, but we could think about this, for instance, about like code switching also. Code switching has an element often of kind of conscious awareness or strategicness to it. And that's because you understand consciously how you're being read in a way that the person you're interacting with doesn't even realize they're encoding you as. Right. Cool. So um, I... I'm glad you brought up the code switching case because, you know, I, I think one of the one of the modeling choices you've made yeah. is not to have, say, an explicit cost of mismatch. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I'm curious, like, if you begin yeah. to titrate a mismatch cost, <laughs> then it starts to make sense for agents to pay a cost yep. to engage yep. in yep. some, exactly. you know, radical expression. <laughs> switching. Yep, exactly. You know, where I might since I have these multiple yeah. representations already, yeah, then yeah. what I have to pay is minimally some cost of switching from one to another. Right, right, right. In all probability, given that you have a fixed topology, yeah. Yeah. Like remembering yeah, right. interaction partners right. and saying like, oh, yeah. I use the sociology yeah. here, <laughs> and like yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. learning one yeah, yeah, yeah. so have you thought about building some of that? The like cost, uh, yeah. Cost and then the ability to deploy more costly processes. Yeah, so so I think this starts getting into, um, I was talking to, I think, Alejandro earlier about um, kind of second order stuff, yeah. right? So given that this might be happening non at the non-declarative level, I mean, so for instance, all of Goffman's work, um, I think, not all of it, but a lot of it like points to uh, kind of ability to be strategic oh. in these arenas, right? So when I do self-presentation, for instance, I have a bit of a kind of knowledge of the repertoires of representation that individuals be using, and I might strategically want to knock it in one direction versus the other. I haven't thought about doing it in terms of incurring costs, but um, I have done it. So if, you know, everybody here in these systems so far started with a kind of um, a relatively uniform weight for confirmations, but you can think about adding in the second layer of having an agenda, 
right? And vis-a-vis uh, -vis that, being able to put up with people not coding you correctly. So we could think about these actually really in terms of coordination cost, right? Like you just accept the fact that you're not gonna be understood for a while in that social context, but are willing to stick it out so as to hopefully, if not necessarily flip others, kind of deconfirm what they have shared at that point in time. But I think that would be interested, but it might get into that. I'll need to do further into that second order. Right there. Yep. Here, in one of these situations where you pushed from an unconscious to a conscious decision making yep. in, in these models, would that remove that agent from the group altogether, yeah. or would there, is there a way to encapsulate that in the same model somehow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a so set of rules maybe yeah maybe. because these are very simple baseline ones, basically they're stuck just forever being in that state. Now, if I wanted to get into those evolvability uh, dynamics potentially, for instance, what we would do is sort of create uh, another iteration of this, which is more, uh, has more agent complexity, for instance, like allow them to potentially try out a new uh, model um, and then make whether or not they continue interacting. Uh, you could also endogenize wherein um, as a potential cost um, that the probability of somebody dropping a tie with me, if I don't make enough sense, hypothetically, um, might um, be endogenized. So there's a lot of ways to play that. So the key thing is just to kind of conceptualize, um, to kind of take that idea at the conceptual level and then map it into exactly how you would want it to play out at this computational implementation, set it up and then allow it to go. Um, so I would not necessarily say that I've made a choice that people just get like cognitively overwhelmed and leave, um, but that could be, that would, uh, my expectation there is you very quickly get a lot of isolated communities of highly entrenched individuals and nobody left who has any questions about what's going on. Model. Not in this one, no. Okay. I'm just thinking of like Steve Daisy's work on, you know, cohorts. Yeah, projects. yeah, so that. So I, I guess I, I was just wondering, you know, coming off this, the question you just got, yeah. whether there was, would be a way, so if you have individuals, you know, mm -hmm. say individuals live for yep. a thousand terms, but you run the model yep. for yep. a million. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then would there be ways to simulate things like having a, a rapid, um, Sort of reconfiguration of social ties at a certain point in people's life, mm -hmm. like going to college. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. You could sort of model the effect. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I would, I, I think that would be, I think that would be uh, great. And yeah, you could readily do that. So um, you can very readily um, do agent death and birth, for instance, and then you can have a question of inheritance, for instance, like how strongly, you know, is the proportion which you come in with a confirmation. Uh, 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 representation confirmed proportional to how confirmed your parent was, mm -hmm. for instance, or um, uh, kind of mentioning the migration stuff, right? You can kind of take individuals, so we could look at what happens when, you know, say you're at the University of Michigan and a lot of students are coming from very different political backgrounds and you suddenly mix them all up together and then see what happens. Um, I think another cool thing would actually to have, if you wanted to look at the non-social environment in conjunction with the social environment, is have there be changes in the non-social environment through time with this birth and death process to see if that can kind of capture uh, sort of generational transitions and representations that more or less fit the, so the non-social background or not. What are the network topologies? Um, but yeah, th I think there's a lot of questions along that line that you could readily implement pretty readily. Would that also, sorry for taking the floor, but would that um, this sort of fit with the non-social environment, yeah. would that help it kind of dovetail with the Boyd and Richardson Yes, I think so. I think that there is potential. Like adaptive, you know, what is the adaptive yep. value of a particular social Yeah, I, I absolutely think too. I think um, especially, uh, uh, maybe a long-term goal, if I can collaborate with some complex systems people, uh, would to be to really be able to model the um, kind of, there, there are essentially two fitness landscapes going on that intersect with one another, right? Like in reality overlay. So there's the um, kind of adaptive biological fitness landscape we can think about, um, which is more prominent in the Boyd and Richardson. And then we have the kind of social niche construction, which is going on right now. And to look at how those two interact with one another and deform one another. Um, Kaufman has the term of dancing landscapes, essentially, how, see how the, these might reconform uh, with one another, I think would be very valuable. I will say even from this really basic stuff that I've done, um, the just looking at, for instance, the correlation in the physical environment that individuals are experiencing 
right there. So if all individuals are experiencing the same non-social environment, it is easy for the system to kind of drive toward walls, connect, that it, then it acts as that attractor. That said, if different individuals in the system are interacting but have different non-social physical background anchors, then the ability of the social system to kind of override um, the non-social seems to become more prominent, for instance. So I think that those two should be um, put into conjunction with one another long term. I, like maybe long term goal is to get the constructionist perspective and the Boyd and Richardson to eventually be able to talk to one another in a kind of really big way. So, yep. Um, so you're doing this for unconscious decision making. Is yep. that just for model simplicity, or do you think that theoretically conscious decision making is, works differently than unconscious? So I'm, sp I'm, I'm doing it specifically because I want to get at this social construction of reality, right? I'm, I'm doing it because I really want to get into social construction of perception. I will say that um, having, it, I think the better we understand the dynamics of that level, we can then reintroduce that conscious decision making. So, but for instance, with the um, economic valuation stuff that I'm doing, the reason I'm interested in uh, this sort of work is because uh, we could think about it in many ways as constituting individual utilities that then feed into conscious decision making. Does that make sense? So like how I assign worth is not atomistic. It really is informed by my social context. And once that utility is constituted, then I have decision making uh, that can hop. Um, in terms of the dynamics, I will say um, I think probably there are a lot of overlaps in some of the dynamics vis-a-vis -vis social learning. Um, but I will say that some of the elements such as the um, rapidity with which we learn declaratively versus non-declaratively, the amount of reinforcement that's required, how it's deployed might make for some significant differences and how they should be modeled to get at them. But I'm not sure yet. Thanks, good question. Yeah. Thank you all. Appreciate it.